How does our product win in the market? What's our differentiated value? Who are we competing against? Well, how do we win? And if we couldn't answer those questions, we can't make a good campaign. We can't write good messaging. We can't do good branding if we don't understand all of these things first. So positioning is really about defining how your product is the best in the world at delivering some value that a well-defined set of customers cares a lot about. Hello and welcome to the Startup Operator Podcast. I'm Roshan Karyapa. April Dunford is a marketing leader and best-selling author of the book, Obviously Awesome, where she explains how you can position your product in a way that customers instantly get your value proposition. In this conversation, I speak to April about the various nuances of positioning and category creation, uh, while also talking about a few contemporary examples from the B2B SaaS world. This is a must-listen for founders and marketers uh, I've tried April's method myself, and I must say that you can really unlock a lot of value with it. So I hope you enjoy this insightful conversation with April Dunford. Hey, April, uh, welcome to the Startup Operator Podcast. Thank you so much for making the time. Hey, it's so good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So like I was saying, I really, really love your book. I think as marketers, we often get too far ahead of ourselves with the latest hacks and what have you. Uh, but your book kind of takes us back to the basics, right? It's a super simple and practical way of understanding what the product really means to the market, you know, before figuring out a thousand ways to amplify your messaging as such. So I think it's such an important book. Hey, thanks so much. Yeah. You know, maybe to begin things, right? Let's talk about this statement that you make um, in the opening section, which is positioning has a positioning challenge. And I agree a hundred percent. I think people really underestimate how effective a good positioning exercise can be, uh, right? And continue to spend their money on campaigns and try to optimize that instead. But my question is, you know, how do we really fix this? How do we, how do we fix positioning about positioning itself? Yeah. Yeah. So it is funny, like positioning is not a new concept. It's an old concept. It's been around forever, but I do think that it is fairly misunderstood. So in general, you know, when I, cause I'm the positioning expert. So when I talk about positioning, people will say, oh, I know what positioning is. It's messaging. And I'll say, well, not really. You know, or they'll say, oh, it's like a tagline or it's, you know, it's it, people talk about branding and positioning like they're the exact same thing. And I don't think that's true. So positioning is is kind of the definition of a bunch of fundamental things that, in my opinion, are inputs into a lot of what we do in marketing and sales. So like early in my career, people would come to me and they'd be like, OK, we're going to do some campaigns. And I'd say, oh, okay, great, let's do some campaigns. But I need some stuff before we do them. Like, who's the campaign for? And you know, we've got a product. How does our product win in the market? What's our differentiated value? Who are we competing against? Well, how do we win? And if we couldn't answer those questions, we can't make a good campaign. We can't write good messaging. We can't do good branding if we don't understand all of these things first. So positioning is really about defining how your product is the best in the world at delivering something, some value that a well-defined set of customers cares a lot about. And that's a bit of a mouthful, but but basically what we're saying is before we do anything in marketing, we got to get really tight on who do we compete with? How are we different? What's the value we can provide that no one else can? And oh, by the way, like who is this product a really good fit for? And once we figure that stuff out, then we can go figure out, you know, well, what are the right campaigns to go get in front of those people? What should the messaging be that communicates that differentiation? Yeah. So a couple of challenges, right? So one is, I think for a lot of startups, I mean, they're a little early in the game, so they don't have enough proof points on all of the questions that you articulated, right? Uh, so they might, they might not know where to start. And the second right. is, I think at some point, everyone's done this whole fill in the blanks exercise, right? Of uh, drafting yeah. or articulating a positioning statement and, and, and really nothing comes out of it, except that, you know, you have this one glib statement that kind of sort of articulates, you know, what you do. Yeah, right. then people write it down and nobody ever looks at it again. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know, I like so so my work sort of comes out of my frustration with the traditional positioning statement, which like you say is this sort of fill in the blanks thing, you know, we are a blank that does blank unlike blank and you're writing in like who your competitors are and what your value is and and you know and what your differentiator is and what your market category is. 
And that bugged me because it just kind of, that whole exercise sort of assumes that I know the right answer. And so even something as fundamental as what's the best fit customer, like who are we targeting, is often very, very poorly defined, particularly at startup. Sometimes we have a target customer that we wish we could serve, <laughs> but it isn't necessarily the people signing up for our stuff. Or sometimes people will say, well, I, everybody loves our stuff. Like, all, you know, all kinds, big companies, little companies, things in the middle. We don't actually know what the common thread is around who loves our stuff. So that's a problem. So, and then you've got this issue, like you were mentioning, like, I'm just starting out. I don't have a lot of customers. How do I actually figure this out? And so in my mind, if you're doing the work properly when you're building a product and you're doing customer discovery, right? So you're out there and you're doing interviews with potential prospects and you're learning a lot about the market space you're going to be in and you're figuring that out. What you have at the beginning is what I would call a positioning thesis, right? So you're basically through those interviews and your research and everything else, you say, okay, here's who I think I compete with. Here's what I think is going to make this product different. This is the value we can deliver to customers that no one else can. And these are the kind of customers that are really, really going to love us. Therefore, this is the market we're going to win. But it's just a thesis. Like, you don't know yet. <laughs> and generally, at least my experience is when we get the thing out in the market and we start selling it and going, eh, you know, the thesis is partially correct, but not totally. And so... I actually think if you're a brand new product and you're just launching into market, you can actually get away with fairly loose, squishy positioning. And that's all right, <laughs> because it's going to change and you don't know how it's going to change. And so I think it's better to keep it a bit loose and vague, even though that's not going to feel good when you're having conversations with customers. It's going to feel like this thing is really squishy. But it's okay. And you're going to get your first wave of customers through brute force anyway. Like it's typically you're not just going to throw up a landing page and get like a million customers coming to you, you know, without doing a lot of heavy lifting. You're going to network your way into it. You're going to like call your friends, call your board members, call everybody you know, try and get some people using this thing. And after you've got a first wave of customers in, you should be on a path to validating that thesis and figuring out, okay, now I'm starting to see some patterns in who loves my stuff and why, and now I can start tightening it up and really go after a segment. But until you get there, you just don't know. Like my bad analogy on this, which I use all the time, but I'll use it again here, is like, let's say you're a fisherman and you said, I'm gonna make a fishing net. And my thesis is, it's gonna be really good for catching tuna. I designed it as a tuna fishing net, it's amazing. Now, I could launch that thing and say, it's only for tuna. Nobody else should look at this. It's just for tuna. And maybe it works for tuna, maybe it doesn't. I don't know because I haven't really got a bunch of customers yet. And instead, I think the smarter thing to do when you're just starting out is just, you know, you launch it and you talk to all kinds of fishermen. You say, you know what? It's a net for fish. I don't know. Big fish, all kinds of big fish. And let's just let people use it and see what we pull up. And what happens sometimes is, you know, we'd be like, oh, look, it's a grouper. I didn't know. It's really good for a grouper. Fishermen love my stuff. And then I can tighten up on the grouper fishing thing and go out and make a whole bunch of money. And, you know, so I think at the beginning, people can actually just chill out about the positioning a little bit. I think that it, ideally you've got a thesis and, you know, and you could write that down and say, here's my competitor. Here's how I'm different. This is my value. Here's what I'm going after. And when you're getting that first wave of customers, you should be looking at that and saying, did this play out the way I thought in my thesis or not? And if it didn't, why not? And, and what is that saying about this thing? And can we adjust the positioning to match what we know now? So anyways, that's my... That's my opinion on that. I don't think people should stress too much in the very early days of a product. They should yeah. just throw it out there and let's see where the market pulls us a little bit. And then once we understand that, then we can tighten up the positioning and really smash our foot on the gas in marketing and sales once we kind of see the pattern. Yeah, no, for sure. I think it's too soon for you to mean anything to anyone, really, when you're starting out, right? I mean, the best you can kind of hope for is to get those 10 or 20 logos as soon as possible and hope like hell that they fall in two or three coherent buckets, right? I mean, that you can then well, double, let's see, double let's down. See what you, let's see what you learn, right? Like, yeah. you know, maybe, and sometimes, it, sometimes you learn the weirdest things that you don't expect. Like, you'll see three, four customers that all really love your stuff and you'll be like, 
but they're all in different industries. Yeah. They're all slightly different sizes. There doesn't seem to be anything common here, but I guarantee you, if you dig under it, you will see the common thread. And sometimes the common thread has nothing to do with the size of the company or the industry or things that you would normally do a segmentation on. Sometimes it's like, oh, people that use this other software all of our stuff or, you know, people that have a certain business model love our stuff or companies that used to use whatever and struggled with this and have this all of our stuff. And so sometimes it's not as easy as just saying, oh, banks love our stuff or you know, dry cleaners <laughs> love our stuff. Like sometimes it's a bit more complicated, but you just don't know until you get in and you dig around and, you know, what's going on here? Who's who loves us and why? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I know you detail this out in the book and I would encourage everyone to get definitely get the book. Of course, it's super practical. But for someone who hasn't read it yet, could you just give a brief summary of how to go about positioning your product? Yeah. So, you know, this idea of how do we actually figure out what our best positioning is, is an idea that vexed me for a long time in my career. So my background is I was a vice president of marketing at a series of successful startups. I think I did like seven of them. So every time I would come in brand new VP marketing and everyone's like, okay, step on the gas, April, let's go generate a whole bunch of leads. And I'd be like, well, do we really know who we're selling to? And do we really understand what our value is? And so I quickly came to the realization that we need to, a process to kind of figure this out. Like it shouldn't just be me mucking around. And so the first couple of products I repositioned with the team, we just kind of threw stuff at the wall until something stuck. We would make something up and go and test it and it'd be kind of good, kind of bad. And we'd wrestle with it for months and months. And that was frustrating. So I thought, well, there must be a better way. And then I you know, I took a bunch of marketing classes, I went to school and I'm, I learned this positioning statement thing. And I said, well, that doesn't solve the problem. It, it, you know, just writing down the word in the blank doesn't make it so. So, you know, if we don't know what market category we should be in, how do we figure that out? So I figured how I would do it is I would break positioning up into component pieces, solve for the component pieces, and then smash it together. Voila, good positioning. So that's how I figured I we could do this. So that's so the first step was let's break it into pieces. Well, if you look at positioning, like we kind of agree on what the component pieces are, and there are five things. So it's who's my competition? So if I didn't exist, what other alternatives are in the market? How is my product different than the alternatives? What is the differentiated value? So what can I do for customers that the other alternatives can't. And then, oh, by the way, what customers? So who's my best fit customer? And then lastly, what's the market category I'm going to position this thing in? So those are the five things. So I, I break it into that. That's pretty easy. We all agree on that. And so then I thought, well, how do I get to the right answer for each of those five things? And so when you look at it, the first thing you realize is the five things all have a relationship to each other. They're not completely independent. So if I look at differentiated value, the differentiated value that my product can deliver for customers that none of the others can is completely dependent on what? What's well, dependent on my differentiated capabilities? Like it doesn't come from anywhere else. That's where it comes from. So those two things are related. And then you say, well, but my differentiated capabilities are only differentiated if I compare them to a competitor. So those three, three things are actually all related. They're not independent at all. And then you say, well, who's my best fit customer? Well, by definition, my best fit customer is the customer that really, really cares a lot about my differentiated value. That's what makes them a good fit for me. So those, I can't figure out one without the other. And then same thing with market category is a little esoteric, but you know, the, the best market category to position my product in is the market category that makes this value kind of obvious to my best fit customer. So those three things are all related. So then I got into this, like everything actually has a relationship to everything else, which the positioning statement doesn't give you any clues to that. And so once I realized that, then I was like, wow, well, the real problem here is where do you start? And there wasn't an obvious good starting point. So for a few years, I kind of mucked around with this model of we have these five things, I'll start with capabilities. I'll work my way around the circle of the other four things. We'll get candidate positioning. We'll take it to the market, test it. If it works, great. If it doesn't, we toss it out and start again. And I did that for two years and it sucked because <laughs> sometimes you don't get it right. Like if you get it right the first time, everyone's happy and we all carry on. But you don't get it right the first time 
then you got to go back and tell your boss, oh, sorry, you know, we spent three months testing that thing, but it doesn't work. So now we're going back to the drawing board. Meanwhile, your CEO is like, I'm not going to survive another two quarters while you muck around with this April. Like, let's get going. So anyways, how I broke out of this was I got really into jobs theory and jobs to be done theory. And I got reading Clayton Christensen and I was really trying to figure out how does jobs theory intersect with this positioning stuff. And the epiphany I came to was we actually have to start with competitive alternatives because if we don't, then what we'll get is something that sounds good in the office, but we take it out to the market doesn't necessarily win. So the way we actually do this is we start with, if I got a product that's in the market and I have customers and more than a first wave of customers, I start with what would a customer do if I didn't exist? Which means, you know, what are the competitors that they like, if they made a short list and picked my stuff, what are the competitors? But also what are they doing to solve that problem today? And that might be using a spreadsheet or hiring an intern or whatever, but I need to figure out what am I positioned against in the minds of customers? And so I need to figure that out. And once I have that, I can say, all right, that's my stake in the ground. This is what I have to beat in order to win a deal. And then I say, well, what have I got that they don't have capabilities wise, like, you know, feature function, what have I got? And usually we can make a giant long list of these things. Like, you know, when I do this with clients, we fill up whiteboards full of it. We got all kinds of capabilities. And then we do this mapping capabilities to value. So if these are all my dif differentiated capabilities, I can go down that list and say, so what? Like for each of them, like, so what for customer? Why does a customer care that you can do this thing? And we're looking for the value themes. We can't have a thousand points of value, but we usually it naturally themes out into two or three value buckets or value themes. And so th then what I've got is I say, look, like the value we can deliver that no one else can is like, I, we can help you do this and here's how we do it. These are the features. We can help you do this. Here's how we do it. We can help you do this. Here's how we do it. Now I've got two, three value buckets. Once I have that, then I can say, all right, this is the value we can deliver. Nobody else can. What kind of customers care a lot about that value? And in particular, I'm looking for what are the characteristics of a target account that make them say, oh, I really, really need that value. And so if I can figure that out, then that's my definition of a best fit customer. And then the, the last bit is market category where we say, okay, I got this value. I'm trying to communicate it to these best fit customers. What's the best context to position that product in that makes that value obvious to them? So am I a database or a business intelligence tool? Am I email or chat or team collaboration? And we can figure this out by holding it up against the value and say, if I call myself that, does that sort of orient customers towards my value or not? So that's how it works in my methodology. Typically what we do is we'll get a cross-functional team together to work through that because I need representation from sales, marketing, customer success, the founders, because everybody's seeing the customer in a slightly different spot in the journey. If I get everyone together and we work through this, generally we can get to a really good answer. Right. It's interesting that you start with the competition, right? Because oftentimes when you talk about, talk to marketers or even founders, you get one of two reactions. One that either that they have no competition, right? They're doing something right entirely brand new, or you get a mile long battle card of every little thing that they do better than hundred other products, right? How does one tease out, you know, what is that top two or top three differentiated value proposition from this that will make all of the difference? Yeah. So starting with competition is really important for exactly that reason. Like typically we're not thinking about it, but trust me, your customers are thinking about it. So your customer, this is how they make a purchase decision right? It, it, like, let's say we're selling to businesses. The boss wakes up in the morning and the boss says, my gosh, we can't keep doing invoices the way we've always done invoices. Or I hate the way we track customers. It sucks. Maybe we need a CRM. I don't know. And the boss doesn't go look for a product. The boss looks around the office and says, you, John, go find us a CRM or go fix this problem. And John goes, Ah, crap. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't know anything about this. I don't know anything about it. And so the first thing John looks at is, well, I don't know, maybe we need a CRM. I should Google CRMs. I don't know. And, and there's a million of them, right? Or, you know, or John says, I don't even know what this thing is called, but we, you know, we have this problem and I'm trying to learn about the problem. And so this is so hard to do. Like you'll end up with a thousand different 
ideas. And then there's however they're solving the problem right now, which might be pen and paper or hiring an intern or just doing it on a spreadsheet. And so you as a vendor need to recognize that this is the this is the customer's struggle. It's actually very hard to make a purchase decision. And so you should be able to come in and clearly articulate, here's why we're better than doing this on a spreadsheet. And here's why we're better than the competition. Now, if you're in a space where there's 9,000 products and they all look the same, uh, like I guarantee you didn't build your product thinking it was going to be the exact same thing as everybody else's. Right? You built it with an idea of how it was going to differentiate. If you have customers today, those customers look at the 9,000 options and they pick you for a reason. What's that reason? Because they're making that choice right now. Now, if you're not selling anything, I can't help you. Maybe your product is terrible. <laughs> like Maybe nobody wants it. But if you're in market, you're selling every day. Customers are making those choices every day. So often what we have to do is to help customers make those decisions, we have to help them make sense out of what looks like a thousand products that look exactly the same. And typically they're not. Typically you'll say, oh, well, look, there's these products here, but they all have this particular approach to the problem. And that's really good if you're a small business, but it doesn't work if you're a biz big business. Or that's really good if your business model is this, but your business model is that, it's not. And then we have this other bunch of competitors and they solve it in a different way. And again, there's pluses and minuses to that. But people pick you because you do this thing that's different and provide a value that's different. And so we need to be able to draw the map for customers and say, look, it looks like a thousand things and they all look the same. But these ones here, they're all a CMS. These things here, they're an LMS and we're a thing in between those or we're something completely different. And here's why it matters to your business. And so I don't think we do enough of that, of helping customers make sense of the whole market and say, it shouldn't be a competition of you versus individual competitors. It should be, look, it's a competition between you and approaches. One approach is use Excel spreadsheet. Another approach is buy one of this category of solutions of which there are 29. Right. And the other approach is buy one of these things. And there's 29 of those too. But here's why a customer like you isn't getting what they want from any of those. And that's why we built what we built. And because of our special features, we can deliver a value that no one else can, not the spreadsheet, not approach A, not approach B. That's the trick in all this. So we shouldn't actually be, you know, unless there's a big gorilla in your market, in which case you can talk about the competitor directly. But most of the time, we're not actually competing with companies. We're competing with approaches. Yeah, I think that's such an important point because I think a lot of enterprise sales is about educating the customer, right? Not just about the solutions at hand, but even about the problems. And you know itself. what? This isn't even just, I would argue this isn't even just enterprise sales. This is anything that I would, that, that is a considered purchase. Yeah, not an impulse right? purchase. And so I don't look at the alternatives that much if I'm going to the store to buy bubble gum. <laughs> it's not a considered <laughs> purchase. There's no stakes here. But it's like, you know, it doesn't matter what I buy. But if, but if I'm going to buy a car, I don't just buy, I don't just look at one. I look at all kinds of cars. I go and do test drives, all kinds of cars. And that's a B2C thing, but there's stakes. It's, it's a, you know, it's a higher ticket purchase. I don't want to make the wrong choice. I'm stuck with it for the next four or five years. Maybe my spouse is going to be mad if I make a bad choice. And it's the same thing with software, right? Like, again, like, this person has been tasked with purchasing software. They don't want to make a wrong choice. They don't want their boss to be mad at them. They don't want all the people that are going to have to use this software to be mad that they made a wrong choice. In B2B software, 40% of purchase processes result in no decision. That means you lost to the spreadsheet. You lost to the intern. You lost to doing this on pen and paper because it was so hard to make a decision amongst the alternatives, the easiest thing for that person to do is to just go back to their boss and say, look, everything sucks. I can't figure it out. And what we're doing is all right. We should just keep doing that. Because you're not going to get fired for that. We're already doing that. That's the easiest thing we could do. So we need to understand this better, I think, in sales, that if it's a considered purchase, it's actually really hard to buy. It's really hard to navigate our choices. And our job in sales and marketing is to help these buyers make sense of all their choices so that they can make a choice they feel good about. Yeah. 
and it's often times a, a a process right i mean it's not something that people pick out on a whim so yeah it's always a process if it's a considered purchase there's a process again if i'm going to the store and i'm buying chips <laughs> i don't care <laughs> what it was on the aisle <laughs> It, right, yeah, like this is you know this is an unconsidered purchase, really. I mean, like I'll just buy the one I've heard of. You know, if I'm going to buy mints, I'm you know I'm just going to like distribution matters more. Branding, and when I say branding, in this case, I mean awareness matters a lot. I've heard of that one. I'll pick that one. Uh, you know, uh, you know, or maybe novelty. It's like, oh, I never tried this one before. Let's do it. You know, what's the worst that happen? I waste a dollar. I never buy that thing again. But it's different if what I'm buying is, you know, something like I just renovated my kitchen and I had to go pick a sink. Huge pain in the ass. There's a thousand sinks. I don't know anything about sinks and I'm a sink user. I know what sinks look like, <laughs> but there's a thousand sinks. I can't tell the difference between one and another, whatever. I had to go to the store like 15 times. Like it's B to C, but that's a considered purchase. And I'm going to have to live with this sink for the next 20 years. So I better buy a good one. <laughs> I don't want it to be crappy. <laughs> I have requirements. Being a buyer is really hard. Our job in the, in our marketing and sales is to help people make choices on that. Like I wish somebody would give me a sync buyer's guide and say, look, if you care about these things, pick this one. If you care about these things, pick this. And if you're kind of like this, you should pick this. But nobody has that. Instead, what I have is 9,000 web seats at sites and they all give me a bunch of features. I don't know whether the features are important to me or not. You know, and in the end... I bought the sink off the, the sales rep that did the best job of saying, oh, look, you know, like your kitchen looks like this. The style is this. You have this. You have three, four things to worry about. You should pick this one or this one. Take your, take your choice. We don't do enough of that, helping people try to figure out what their choices are. But it's getting harder though, right? I mean, for buyers and for sellers, I mean, especially in SaaS, I mean, with the explosion of uh, SaaS that we're seeing right now, there are multiple products and categories being created, sometimes for problems that don't even exist or haven't even been articulated right. already, right? So, so <laughs> yeah, well, it, like we can't, like category alone isn't going to save us. Because again, if you, if you think like, I think there's this magical thinking going on right now that if I create a new category, and then position myself and I'm the only one in that new category, then I win all the business, <laughs> which is ridiculous, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's magical yeah. thinking. Like this is nuts. And, and very, very, very hard to create a new category. The vast majority of successful startups did not start out creating a new category. They started out positioning in an existing category, but capturing a sub-segment of that category that was underserved. And sometimes it doesn't take much. Like sometimes it's, a handful of features that don't actually seem like big deal things. But if I, again, if I'm a buyer and I'm trying to choose between a lot of things that kind of look the same, two, three features that can deliver some value for me, it's worth picking that thing for that reason. So again, if you got a thing in market and you're selling, people are picking you every day. People are confronted with this thousands of things that look just like you and they pick you why is it they pick you? And what is it about those weirdos that make them think that your thing is so important to buy? If you can figure that out, then you can sell. Then there's this other problem of someone saying that, let's say a prospect saying, hey, this is interesting. And uh, you never hear back from them, right? I mean, this whole distance between a, a nice to have and a need to have, right? Getting someone to budget for your software now versus them saying hey this is pretty interesting right i mean yeah so th that's that's quite a that's quite a journey itself i mean any advice on you know how you can get people to prioritize what you're offering yeah well i mean it really comes down to value like value is a difficult concept in marketing and it, but people really need to master this idea like it, it, you know so if you say look uh, the thing you're doing now is is slow and you know your users make mistakes and we can speed it up and you'll make less mistakes the, the next question is going to be speed it up how much because like if it's 10 seconds i don't care <laughs> and even if it's two hours maybe i don't care like what am i going to do with those two hours that i'm not doing now and if you say oh well, mistake costly mistakes it's like well 
I don't know. Have I, have I experienced the pain of a mistake? And what's the value of not making that mistake? Like, what's my life going to look like if I adopt this thing? Because again, it's really easy for me to just keep doing the thing I'm doing. Zero risk. I'm not going to get fired for saying we should just keep doing the thing we're doing. 40% of the time, that's how they're going to decide. They're going to say, you know what? I, I get your thing is better. It's just not better enough for me to take the risk of sticking my neck out, going to my boss, saying, I need the budget, I need the thing. Like, you got to come in there with some big value to say, look, like, here's a whole bunch of stuff that you just, you're never going to do it with this, right? So people, I think, need to really focus in on that. It's not the feature that matters. The feature might actually be small and insignificant. But if you can capture the imagination of a prospect with the value that feature delivers, like, so if I have this feature, here's the things you can do that are impossible today. And here's why that matters to your business. And you really got to run at that. The second part of this equation, though, is... Again, not everyone's going to care about that value. So first you got to understand the value. And then you got to understand of all the people I could go sell to, who really, really gives a shit about that? <laughs> and how do I find them? And let's spend all our time talking to them instead of talking to like 90% of the people on the planet don't care about this value, but there's 10% that care a lot. Let's spend all our time talking to that 10%. We're going to sell a lot if we do that. But most of the time what we get is we'll get to value, the value's kind of mushy, and then we're just sort of spraying and praying the message all over the place. And, and nobody's really interested because there's only one in a hundred really cares about that value. Like it's the equation on both sides. I got to really understand the d differentiated value. And then I got to really understand who's a good fit prospect for that. And how do I get in front of a bunch of people that are in this sub segment of the market that really, really cares about that value? That's where the magic happens. Yeah. Sometimes the magnitude and frequency of the pain doesn't really add up, right? Uh, doesn't really amount to much, you know, and uh, as a prospect, I mean, they're, they're able to live with that threshold of pain. I mean, they've been doing it for this time. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Like, you what, like what you'll get is like, so I, you know, I worked with this company and uh, what they did was software for helping you visualize your strategic plan. So big, big companies have like a big strategic plan. And then the strategic plan dribbles down to all the, everybody in the organization has their targets and things they're doing to help execute on the plan. And so what these guys do is they have this really neat software that lets you visualize all the way down where you're tracking against the strategic plan. And they make it really visual. Like there's other software that does this. It's not so visual. They make it really visual so you can figure out, ah, we're falling behind here. We need to fix this, you know, and so we can really stay on top of where we should focus our energy. Great. So then you say, all right, well, who cares a lot about that? Well, you might say anybody that's got a strategic plan and that's in at the beginning, that's who they're focused on. They're like, we're going to work with the the consultants that help companies do strategic plans and blah, blah, blah. But, but think about it. Like, I don't know about you. You ever work at a big company? I worked at IBM once. We had a strategic plan. Did anybody care if we were tracking against the plan? No, <laughs> no, it was a stupid exercise. No one cared. I guarantee you, nobody woke up in the morning going, Ooh, where are we tracking a strategic plan? Nobody cared. So I think there's a lot of companies out there. That, so I'm like, well, who really cares? Like, you know, like if you, cause that's your thing, you're going to make it really easy to track. Like who really cares if we're tracking the strategic plan? Well, the answer to that is, well, if the reason we have a strategic plan in the first place is because we got in trouble, like we broke the law, we got in trouble with a regulator, we got a fine. And then we had to go tell the board and the board's freaking out. And you, and what do you say? You say, don't worry, we got a plan to fix it. And the board says, great. Now I want you to report on that plan every quarter you come back here. Those people really care about whether or not it's tracking because they got to report to the board. They got to report to everybody. So now what these guys can do is say, okay, give me a list of companies that got in trouble with the regulator. And I'll go sell to them and I'll sell everybody because they all really, really care a lot about the value that only I can deliver. And that's different from just saying, oh, we're just going to sell to everybody with a strategic plan or like our stuff. It's like, well, not really, actually. All the other guys can help you track a strategic plan, too. Their differentiator is really making this thing visible. Well, who cares about that? Somebody whose hair is on fire <laughs> and they're going to get fired if they don't show exactly what, you know, they really got to actually execute on the plan. Those people care a lot. Well, how do I know that they're on the, you know, they have a hair on fire problem? Well, because they, you know, they broke the law. They got a fine. They did something. And so, well, now I can identify them. Now I can go chase just them and I'll win way more business. 
Yeah. And I think your differentiated value proposition cannot just be convenience, right? I mean, it has to be something quantifiable. And like you've mentioned before, I think it, it has to be something that someone will lose their job if they don't do this particular thing, right? Maybe, maybe. I mean, sometimes what you've got is you're just relieving this pain. Like, I worked with a company once that, that had some software that was helping to get contractors paid. And, um, and it made it really, really efficient to do that. And, and then you say, well, who cares a lot about that? Well, if you have a, just a couple of contractors, no big deal. And again, like save you a couple of minutes, not a big deal. But if you looked at their best fit customers, their best fit customers had thousands of contractors and, and they could save a significant amount of money. Like instead of having four people doing this job of getting the contractors paid, you could have one. And that's a significant cost savings, a significant time savings. The contractors are all happier. They're getting paid faster. They're getting paid more accurately, helping them retain contractors. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. But you only care once it hits a certain threshold. You don't care if there's just like, it's, you know, I'm going to save five minutes. Who cares? But it's like if I have thousands and thousands of contractors, well, now I actually really care a lot because this is like a bottleneck to my whole operation. So I think you gotta think like that. Again, it's both sides. It's not just the value, it's the value and who really cares about that value. You put those two things together, that's where the magic happens. Right. Like you mentioned, everyone wants to build a category right now, right? Even if it's just them in the category. And yeah, it's, it's, it. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> and it's, uh... it's like, we're so stupid. Like I honestly, like I think what happens in marketing is we get really excited about trends, like something new comes and we're like, oh my God, that's so exciting. And usually what happens is it's a thing that works in a very narrow, narrow set of circumstances. But then we get so excited about it. We're like, can we all just do that? <laughs> and so if you look at companies that have successfully created a category, you will see a handful of things about them. One generally the company was not a category creator when they were small. They were category, they created the category once they were significant size. And when I say significant, I'm talking hundreds of millions of revenue, like a size that the vast majority of companies never get near that size. And they've already completely dominated their category. And now what they're actually doing is expanding the category by calling it something different and making it bigger. The, the vast majority of examples that people use like Salesforce, like <laughs> Salesforce, it was a niche play in the CRM business until there were hundreds of millions of revenue. There was a big competitor in there already that dominated the CRM business. And Salesforce came in and, and said, we're going to go to the bottom and dominate the, the SMB market. And they did that for years. Their killer feature was no software because all the other CRMs were on-prem software, so you needed an IT department. These small companies that didn't have an IT department could adopt Salesforce. So they were a niche play in an existing market forever. And yet people talk about them as, oh, category creators, and they've done this platform as a service thing. And yes, they have, once they were a couple hundred million revenue. And you know what? When you're a couple hundred million revenue, you there's all kinds of things you can do that a tiny startup can. Um, if you look at most small startups that attempt to create a category actually get killed in the category they created because it is so difficult to create the category. So you actually need very deep pocketed patient investors to get this done. Because what typically happens is right at the moment when the category is starting to emerge because you've created it, that is a perfect time for a bunch of venture backed startups to come into your space and steal it from you. That's why we don't use Ask Jeeves and we use Google. That's why we don't use MySpace. We use Facebook. That's why, like, Apple has never created a category except arguably maybe a tablet. But, I mean, it, they flew in behind BlackBerry in the smartphone market. Like, everybody forgets this. <laughs> like, it's like, I, I don't understand it. But, we, you know, we get this thing and we're like, oh, and we can, and everyone uses the same five examples over and over and over again and said, well, these five companies did it. And they ignore the 29,000 companies that failed at it. Do I think you should never create a category? Absolutely not. Sometimes you have no choice. Like sometimes what you're doing is truly super innovative. The category itself is emerging 
no one owns that category. And you actually have the opportunity to be the owner of that category, shape how we think about it and emerge with it. Um, but I think that is a rare instance. And I think even if you do attempt to do that, the majority of the time you will lose to fast followers that come in right when your investors are starting to get pissed off because nothing's happened yet. And we're 10 years in and the category still isn't emerging. And so a lot of what I see right now is people attempting to do it are either just saying the words in marketing. Like that's another thing I see right now is they'll say the words in marketing, like this is our category. But when you actually get them on the phone, they'll say, actually, we're just a chat bot, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Or they'll say, what is this thing? Oh, it's, you know, it's actually just CRM for this. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> anyway, so I see just ridiculous category creation stuff going on right now. I don't understand it. But I also see a lot of people attempt it, give it a go for a year or so. It doesn't work so good. And then they roll it back and they try to do yeah. something else. No, I think the best examples of category creators didn't start out as category, category creators, as you mentioned, right? I mean, Slack wasn't the workspace for remote about five years back also, right? Drift wasn't conversational marketing. Yammer was in out. there way before Slack was, right? Like, yeah, exactly. like you know, I, I would argue Yammer, like Yammer paved the way for Slack. And it's not like they were a small company either. Like, I mean, there was, there was already a bunch of this stuff going in. So I don't think Slack was a category creator. Drift, on the other hand, I think did a, did a, a neat job of basically saying, well, like, we don't want to be in the chat bot space, you know, because we have a competitor that looks exactly like us. But what they really are is chat bot for marketing. What they did, I think, people call it category creation, and I'm probably being hair splitty here as the marketer, but what they actually did was created an idea around a value prop, which was this conversational marketing idea. And so I thought that was really intriguing. And I think HubSpot did a did an interesting job with inbound marketing inbound. in the, in the yeah. same way. But if you but if you were to say like you know what is that thing? And I, I'm also really curious why why Drift abandoned it and. You know, like you generally don't abandon your category if it's working well. Like it takes. A, I think they've, they've become broader effort. now. Like they raised an incredible amount of money to build that thing, and then they just kind of threw it out the window and said, "Well, now we want to go after sales too, and we think that's too limiting, so we're going to call it." And I don't even remember what the new thing is called. Like I don't, I'm not sure how yeah. that's going. They're more marketing automation than you know than than a chatbot at this point of time. I and mean, they've added a bunch of features and so on because. I think they kind of hit the limits or hit the ceiling with the whole conversational marketing uh, space as such, right? I mean, there's there's only so much of a premium you can charge for for whatever it is they were offering. Well, and I, I, you know, I also think that that technology is new, and so you know, when when that stuff first came out, I think we had higher hopes for it than it could actually deliver. I think there was a bit of a inflated expectations for that technology across the board, and what we could do with it from a marketing standpoint and, you know, how much it was worth and how much we'd be willing to pay for it. I mean, I think we're still kind of new in that space. Yeah. So the other point that you make right, is but that- Yeah, like they're, they're, you know, like name me five more. You yeah. can't, right? Like all we ever do is yeah. talk about drift. It's so funny. It's like, <laughs> like, you know, and they raise hundreds of millions of dollars. Like what makes us think we can do that? Like there's such an outlier. And yet everybody's like, well, oh, those guys did it. <laughs> it's like, well, I don't know. A, jury's out. And B, like, did they? I don't know. Like, and if you had 200 million, would you grow quickly too? I, I, maybe if you had a great team. And so maybe it had nothing to do with that. I, like, I don't know. I think in, in marketing, we do a lot of this, right? Like we'll, we'll point to, again, one or two examples and try to make the rule out of that. And what I want to see is 50 examples, 100 examples. Like if I go down, so I actually did this exercise because I have this conversation about category creation so much. And I was like, all right, if category creation is so hot and so great, then we would expect that a majority of companies in the last five years that have gone public on the NASDAQ would be category creators, correct? I would expect to see that. So I went down and looked at all the companies that went public on the NASDAQ. And at the time they went public, which makes them kind of big, like at least 100 million, right? So at the time they went public, so you, you never even know. They, maybe they weren't category creators at the beginning. But at the time they went public, what percentage of those were category creators? 8%. <laughs> this is the exception, not the rule. 
So yeah, I don't know why. I think VCs like category creation too. Like I think they. I think, I think they it's like just the, the the excitement and the potential of a new market, I suppose. Right. So. Yeah, it's um, trendy. Yeah. So the point you also make in the book is that positioning isn't just a, a marketing problem. It impacts everything, right? I mean, from the kind of accounts your salespeople target to the kind of product investments you make and so on and so forth. Um, so for someone who's listening to this, how can they get a buy-in from all of their functional heads? How can they get those folks to prioritize this as well? Yeah. So my experience, having done this for 20 years inside as the VP marketing is if we treat positioning as a little marketing thing that the marketing department cooks up and then throws over the wall to everybody else, we will fail. Like everyone in the company will ignore us, particularly sales. And and sales is, you know, is where the rubber meets the road on a lot of this positioning stuff. If your sales reps are choosing to pitch it a way that's different from your marketing, you're really dead. I also don't think that the CEO, if you're a reasonably sized company, I don't think the CEO can just cook it up and throw it over the fence to marketing sales and product either. Because what happens typically is that marketing and sales and product will say, yeah, yeah, we'll run with that. But everybody has a slightly different idea about what it actually means because they weren't involved in building it. And then they'll run off trying to execute on that. And what you'll get is this mushiness in the positioning because we are not aligned. So having done this a lot in-house um, before I became a consultant, I got really convinced that if we want to do really good positioning and make it stick, it has to be a cross-functional effort. And ideally, the CEO is driving it. So the CEO is bringing everybody together. But we actually need input from sales, marketing, customer success, product. And we all need to have a little bit of a fight about it and get agreement and alignment on it when we're building it so that we don't have anybody saying, yeah, you know, marketing cooked that up, but I don't believe it or you know, stupid thing, you know, or, oh, that's fine for marketing to say that, but it doesn't sell. Or the product people are like, marketing cooked this up. The product doesn't even do that. <laughs> I've seen that before. <laughs> Why did they ignore all our best features when they built that thing? So I think the way to get around that is let's get everybody to the table because sales sees one thing, marketing sees something else. Product knows a lot about the, the like, Product knows so much about the product that marketing and sales generally don't even understand. And we need to actually pull that out of product and get it into marketing and sales where we can do something with it. And then, you know, generally the CEO has a good idea of what the ultimate vision is for the company, what they've been selling the investors. We need to bring all that stuff together and figure out, you know, not what the vision is, what, what is the best story to wrap around this product in the state that it's at right now to maximize revenue and maximize what we're doing in marketing and sales right now. And if we can get everybody to the table, you know, we'll we'll get a way better output than we did than we would if it was just one group working on it. And we'll also get everybody will have this deep understanding because they'll understand how we got there so that everybody can go then go and execute on it. So in my opinion, it's a team sport. We got to get everybody together. Like marketing can be the shepherd of it once or the steward of it once we have it. But, you know, we need to have this cross-functional team. And then to make everything even more complicated, like the positioning's not static. Your, your competitors aren't standing still. You're putting out new releases. Your customers change. And so we need to actually come back and check in on that marketing every six months or so just to make sure like that has the competitive landscape changed has, you know, we had features that were differentiating six months ago, but maybe the competitors caught up or maybe we put out something new and that changes our differentiated value. So we actually need to bring that team together regularly every six months or so at a minimum, I think to just run through the exercise again and say, has anything changed? Nope. Well, then the positioning is the same. Is something big changed? If so, does it warrant a change in positioning? And if so, we need to make an adjustment. Right. This is further complicated if you're operating in multiple, let's say, geographies, markets and industries, right? And is it okay to position a product multiple ways across these different permutations and combinations? Because you could kind of mean different things for a customer, let's say, in Asia versus someone in the US, right? So, or, or I mean, do you kind of suggest tying all of this together in one cohesive sort of a positioning 
uh, exercise or, uh, or uh, I mean, it's okay to maintain these disparate forms. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing. If you're small and you're a startup, sometimes you'll have this thing that you'll say, hmm, I've got these customers, but they use the product this way and their value is this. And then I got these customers and they use the product this way and their value is this. So what do I do? So one option is I could, I could position the product completely differently for these two sub segments and carry on. Well, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is like, if they really are that different, like the use cases are different. That means the competitive is the competitors are different. The differentiated value is different. The kind of customer you're serving is different, completely different positioning, right? So what's going to happen next year? When you look down the product requirements, they're going to be completely different. It would be a miracle if the product requirements would be the same. Eventually, you're going to have two products. That's where this goes. Like, you know, if, if it really is like that. And so typically what happens is if you're really small, you, you got to make a decision. Like I can't serve both because I don't have enough development teams to build. I don't have enough developers and whatever to build two products for these two different markets. Like unless I want to be a two product company and I think I got the resources to do that, but generally you can't. So generally you're going to have to make a decision and say, I'm chasing this market with this value prop and that's it. Now, sometimes what you have is they appear to be different, but they're not. And so I've seen this a lot in companies that I've worked with that they'll say, well, the way we pitch these guys and these guys totally different, but, but it's the same product and whatever. And I said, well, let's just see, let's just run through the exercise and, you know, and we'll look and maybe the competitors are a little bit different. Maybe the different, the capabilities are a little bit different, but when we map it to value, it's kind of the same. And that would make sense. They're both using the same product. Like, so usually what we'll have is, you know, there'll be like, let's say we have three value propositions. Like one is, you know, we're going to help you save time by doing this and we're going to save you some money by doing this and we're going to help you do whatever. Like for segment one, it's one, two, three, but for segment two, it's actually three, two, one, but it's the same value. We just put a slightly different emphasis on it for one versus the other. So sometimes I've seen that. But typically, we cannot survive with one product serving two completely different markets with two completely different positions in the market. Like what happens is that product then forks and we need one product for the one market and one for the other. And we got to decide, like, can we actually do that? And if we're early stage startup, we can't. So typically, we'll just make a call. We can't serve both of these. So which one looks better for the business? And we'll pick so the one the that, that looks like that's a better future. Yeah. So on that note, right, in, in terms of talking to customers, I, I think that gleaning from what customers say is an art and science in itself. You can't take yeah. everything that they say at face value uh, and yet they have a lot of value to offer, right? I mean, in terms of their pain and so on, right? They're great at talking about their problems, not so great at, you know, sourcing solutions for those problems necessarily. Oh, How should one really listen to customers and filter the signal from the noise? Yeah. So I think there's lots of different things you're looking for from customers when you're doing customer research. Like, I think, you know, you might be thinking about building a new feature. And so you want to go and, you know, do interviews with customers to make sure you understand the job they're trying to do and whether this feature is going to help them make progress on that job and whatever. But for things like positioning specifically, what I really need to understand is how the customer makes a purchase decision. Because if I just walk in and say to a customer, what do you love about our stuff? You know, they'll, they'll tell me things like, oh, we really love your support. Your support's amazing. You know, I, the, the, other, the other guys had terrible support. You have great support. But did, did they actually experience the support in the purchase process? A lot of times they don't. And so that's not why they picked you. That might be why they renew with you. So it's still important, but it's not why they, it doesn't get them in the door. So if I'm in, if I'm trying to figure out positioning, I can't position around that because it's it's not actually a buy feature; it's a retain feature. And so what I really want to understand from customers, if I'm doing positioning work, is I need to understand what I get compared to. So I really need to understand what is the status quo in the account because I lose forty percent of my deals to that. So I got to really make sure I'm positioned against that. And then I need to understand who actually shows up on a short list, not who could, who could compete with me, 
but who actually does compete with me? So often what you'll get again is inside the company, they'll say, oh my God, we have all these competitors. Like, you know, product is guilty of this. The product management team will say, oh my God, you know, here's my 59 competitors that I'm tracking. But then you go to sales and you say, who do you see? Like who ends up on a short list? And they'll say, it's just Oracle. We don't see anybody else. Oh, that makes it a lot easier to position, doesn't it? And when we start seeing one of these other ones, then we'll worry about positioning against them once they show up. But I don't have to position against phantom competitors that my customer knows nothing about. And so sometimes we get all smart. We do the research and we'll say, oh, these people are a competitor. Not my books, they're not. They're not a competitor until a customer says they're a competitor. If they never show up on a short list, you know, maybe I want to keep them on my radar. Maybe product who's doing longer term planning wants to, you know, put them on the list of things to look at. But for marketing and sales, again, I don't have to worry about positioning them against anybody that doesn't show up on a short list. So that's what I'm really looking for in customer research. If I'm trying to figure out how to position stuff, I want to know, what were you using before? What made you wake up in the morning and decide you couldn't do it that way anymore? What was that purchase trigger? When you did decide to buy something, how'd you make a short list? What were your criteria? Where did you go and look? Where did you do your research? Because I need to show up in those places. And then you pick me over everybody on the short list. Why'd you pick our stuff? And good question to ask is, why didn't you pick the other ones? Because sometimes they, sometimes they're not picking you because of you. They're picking you because the other ones did something terrible and then they can't pick them. Yeah. The less <laughs> and that's how you got the it. deal. So so that that's the kind of set of questions I would do or I used to do when I was doing this work um, in in-house. Now often um if we have product in market, we have a significant number of customers. If I have a direct sales team, I can often pull that information out of sales without having to go directly to the customer because a good sales rep knows this stuff. A good sales rep knows what the status quo is in the account. They know what the purchase trigger was. They know who else they're competing against on the short list and they know why we get picked. So. I don't always have to go out and do that research if I've got a good, smart, direct sales team. If I don't have a direct sales team or my direct, you know, my sales team is kind of immature or they don't get into it with customers too deep, then I'm going to have to go get it. Right. I have a bunch of other questions, but I know we're at the top of the hour. So okay, we're running out of time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, uh, April. This was uh, really, really insightful. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Startup Operator Podcast. Uh, we put out a couple of episodes every week and a roundup where we talk about the news and events from the Indian startup ecosystem. Do share all of this content with your fellow startup operators. Uh, it could be valuable and insightful for them. Also, before you leave, uh, follow us on social media. We're on LinkedIn and Twitter and subscribe to our WhatsApp newsletter. If you want all of this content delivered to your inbox. Thank you and have a great day.